Hi everyone, in this video I'm going to be going through some dilution calculations which will combine approaches that I've discussed in previous videos on this topic. Calculating concentrations and dilutions is an area that many students find complicated and hard to master. And one really common reason for finding this skill difficult is if you focus too much on trying to remember specific concentration or dilution equations and then apply these blindly like magic spells without really thinking or understanding what the calculation is actually doing. So what I'm going to do is describe a simple serial dilution scenario where the question is, what's the final concentration? But then I'll be solving the same problem in four different ways, but all starting with the same simple concentration equation. The aim of this is to show you that there isn't a single way of undertaking this calculation. In fact, there are many ways, and providing you apply common sense, it doesn't matter how you calculate the concentration in a serial dilution, they'll all give you the same answer. Actually, it's the very process of considering the different ways of calculating the same result that is what will probably help you get a firmer grasp on how to do this quickly and easily in the future. So here's our simple serial dilution scenario. Let's imagine that we've weighed out a small quantity of a salt and we're going to dissolve that in an initial stock solution. Then we'll take a small aliquot of that, put it in another standard flask, dilute that up to the mark, and we'll call that solution A. Then we'll take a small aliquot of solution A, put that in another standard flask, make that up to the mark, and we'll call that one solution B. Finally, we'll take a small aliquot of solution B, put that in a final standard flask, make that up to the mark, and we'll call that one solution C. So the question is, what's the concentration of salt in solution C in the final flask? So now we understand the general setup, we need to fill in some numbers so that we can actually undertake the calculations. So for the purposes of this demo, let's imagine we've weighed out 267 milligrams of the salt. And then having made up that stock solution, let's imagine we took a 1 mil aliquot of that to make solution A, and then a 1 mil aliquot of solution A to make solution B, and then finally a 5 mil aliquot of solution B to make solution C. And then because we're going to be doing the calculations in Excel, I've already put that information into Excel. So here you can see in the top row the mass is 267 milligrams, and that's going to be dissolved in 100 milliliter flask. And then we take a 1 milliliter aliquot of that in a 10 milliliter flask, and then a 1 milliliter aliquot of that in another 10 mil flask, and then finally a 5 mil aliquot into the last 10 mil flask. And I also think it's worth explaining the shorthand that I'm using to describe the aliquots. So you'll see I have a little symbol after them in each cell where they're labelled. This is just a shorthand that I use to help me remember where the aliquot is coming from and where it's going to. So in this case, aliquot S to A means the aliquot is coming from the stock solution and going into flask A. And similarly, the next aliquot down is the aliquot that is coming from solution A and going into flask B, so that's why it's aliquot A into B. And then these are the four different methods that we're going to use to calculate the concentration in the final flask. Now don't worry, we'll go through each one of them in turn, but to start off with, we'll work out the concentration in the final flask by working out exactly how much salt is transferred from flask to flask in each aliquot and then use that to calculate the concentration in each of the flasks down the line. The second route we'll use is to use the C1V1 equals C2V2 method to calculate the concentration in each of the flasks directly. And then the last two methods are the ones that I actually use far more in practice. So the third method we'll look at is to use the dilution factors approach to calculate the concentration in the final flask. And the last method is perhaps the most intuitive, and that's to calculate the quantity fraction transferred between each flask in order to calculate the concentration in the final flask. But as I say, don't worry, we're going to step through each one of these in turn. As always with concentration calculations, the units are going to give us the main formula that we're going to need to use. 
And of course, it makes most sense to use units of concentration that reflect the units used to measure both the salt that we're dissolving and the volume of liquid that it's been dissolved in. So in this case, the mass of the salt was 267 milligrams and the volume of the standard flask was 100 milliliters. So the most obvious unit of concentration that we could be using in this case is milligrams per milliliter. And that's always written as mg over ml, which of course is just a fraction. And as always, to calculate the numerical value of the fraction, you just need to divide the number on the top by the number on the bottom. So really, this unit for concentration is telling us that concentration equals milligrams divided by milliliters. So the units really are giving us the equation we need. But to make it easier for us to reuse this through the rest of the presentation, we'll just abbreviate concentration as C, mass to M, and volume to V. So remember that as we go through this serial dilution process, we take an aliquot out of the stock solution to supply the salt for solution A, and then we take an aliquot of solution A to provide all the salt for solution B, and finally we take an aliquot of solution B to provide all the salt for solution C. So let's jump back to the beginning of the process. We know the mass of the salt and the volume of the stock flask, so we can calculate the stock concentration by using the equation concentration equals mass over volume. Then, because we know the concentration and the volume of the aliquot that we'll take out of the stock flask to pass to solution A, we can calculate the quantity of salt dissolved in that aliquot by rearranging the main equation to move all the parts we know onto one side, so we can calculate the bit we don't know, the quantity of salt dissolved in that aliquot. We know the stock solution concentration, and we know the volume of the aliquot we've taken out of the stock flask, so we need to pull V, the volume, over to this side of the equation to allow us to calculate the mass. And that rearrangement leaves us with concentration times volume equals mass. Then because we now know the mass of salt in solution A, we can calculate its final concentration because we know the concentration will equal the mass transferred in the aliquot divided by the total volume of the flask. And then we simply have to repeat this process down the serial dilution. Every time we move an aliquot into a flask, we calculate the mass of salt we're transferring, and then we calculate the final concentration in that flask based on that transferred mass and the total volume of the flask. So we simply need to step through each flask in turn, calculating the mass of salt in the flask and then its concentration, through each flask, down the line, until we can calculate the concentration of the final flask. So now let's jump into Excel and see how we would undertake this calculation route in practice. So the first stage of the calculation is to calculate the concentration of the solution in the stock flask. And we do that using this equation that if you remember we derived simply knowing the units of concentration we expected. And these values already exist in cells in the spreadsheet, so we can calculate the concentration in this cell using an Excel function where we'll simply divide the mass from this cell by the volume in this cell. And we always have to keep track of the units, so we'll make sure the units end up going in this column. And now we know the stock concentration, because we know the volume of the aliquot we're taking out of the stock flask to transfer to flask A, we can calculate the mass of salt that's being transferred over in that aliquot. And it's worth reiterating again that we calculate that by simply rearranging the initial equation so that we're now multiplying the concentration of the solution by the volume of the aliquot. So let's enter that calculation onto the sheet too. we need to multiply the concentration by the volume. And that'll give us a mass in milligrams. And now we know the quantity of salt in that flask, 
we can use that together with the volume to calculate the concentration. Mass divided by volume equals concentration. And now we need to calculate the quantity of salt in this aliquot. And we do that by multiplying the concentration of the aliquot, in this case the concentration of flask A, by the volume of the aliquot. And then we can use that mass to calculate the concentration once the flask is topped up. So that equals the mass of the salt in the flask divided by the volume of the flask. And then we can repeat that process one final time by again calculating the quantity of salt in the last aliquot and then using that mass of salt to calculate the concentration in flask C. What this shows is that we are able to calculate this entire serial dilution series just using our knowledge of the units of concentration. From that unit we were able to derive the basic equation that concentration equals mass divided by volume, and then we were able to rearrange that simply to work out that concentration times volume must equal mass. So then, in every cell in this list where we needed to calculate a concentration, we've been able to use this equation, and for every intermediate calculation where we needed to calculate a mass, we were able to use this one. So now let's go on to look at the next way I could have calculated the concentration in flask C. Here you can see the two equations that we've been working with so far. This equation is the equation for calculating the concentration if you know the mass of the salt and the volume of the flask, and remember we derived that simply from knowing the units of concentration. And this second equation is simply a rearrangement of the first equation which allows us to calculate the mass of the dissolved salt, given a particular concentration of solution, and the volume of that solution that we have. So now let's think about what happens when we put an aliquot into a flask and then top it up to the line. As in the first method of calculation, we know the concentration of the solution in the aliquot, and of course we know the volume of the aliquot. So with those two bits of information, we can therefore calculate the quantity of salt that was actually dissolved in that aliquot, and here we give that the symbol Ma. And once the flask is topped up, of course, the same algebra remains true, that the concentration of the solution in the whole flask, multiplied by the volume of that flask, must also calculate the mass of salt dissolved in the whole flask. But because the only source of salt in this flask was the aliquot, therefore the mass of salt in the entire flask must equal the mass of salt that was in the original aliquot. And so both of these masses must be the same. Then, because both of these equations equal the same mass, that means we can bring them together like this. And then the mass part in the middle actually becomes redundant, so we can just remove it so the final equation looks like this. which of course leaves us with an equation you probably recognise as C1V1 equals C2V2. In the case of our serial dilution, we can apply this in a particular way. Because we know the concentration and volume of the incoming aliquot, and we know the volume of the flask that it's going into, we can rearrange the equation so that all the values we know go on one side, and that permits us then to calculate the concentration that will result in that flask. So then, in order to calculate the final concentration, we simply apply that equation to first find the concentration for flask A, and then the concentration for flask B, 
and then finally we apply it to flask C to work out that final concentration. So now let's see how we could apply this route for calculating the concentrations in Excel. You'll notice that we're back in the same spreadsheet as we were before, except that I've tidied up the first entries before we start this new route just to keep everything neat. As with the calculations down the first route, the first thing we need to know is the concentration of the stock solution. Now I know we've already calculated that, but I'm going to calculate each one of these routes individually as if it was being calculated by itself. So to calculate the concentration in the stock flask, we need to divide the number of milligrams of salt by the volume of the flask. And keeping track of the units, of course, as always. Now, because we're using the C1V1 equals C2V2 route, we can jump straight to calculating the concentration in flask A using the concentration of the stock solution multiplied by the volume of the aliquot and then divided by the volume of flask A. So just to make it more obvious what's going on, I'll just label the parts of the equation that I've just entered. And then we can apply exactly the same process to calculate the concentration in flask B, using the concentration and volume of the aliquot being put into the flask, and then the volume of flask B itself. And then finally we do the same thing again to calculate the concentration in flask C. And down at the bottom here you can see that it doesn't matter which of these two routes we've used to calculate the concentration, they're both giving the same answer. So we've looked at two of the routes for calculating the concentration in flask C, and now let's look at the third one. Remember that the units of concentration tell us that to calculate a solution's concentration, we have to divide, in this case, the mass of the salt by the volume of the solution. Now if you look closely at this equation, you can see that if the mass stays the same, but I make the volume bigger, in order for the equation to still balance, the concentration then has to be smaller, because I'm dividing the mass by a bigger number. And in fact, because the equation needs to balance, if I make the volume twice as big, then the concentration needs to go down by the same factor. It'll be half as concentrated as it would have been before. If I increase the volume 10 times, then the resulting concentration will be 10 times less. So if in one of our flasks we add an aliquot of solution and then add more solvent up to the mark, then from the point of view of the salt dissolved in the aliquot, the volume of the liquid that it's in has increased from the original aliquot volume to the volume of the whole flask. In the case of flask A in our example, the aliquot volume is 1 milliliter, and the final flask volume is 10 milliliters. So that means the final volume is 10 times bigger than the original volume, so the concentration must have gone down tenfold. And we say that we've had a tenfold dilution in this flask, or that the dilution factor is 10. So that's how to calculate the dilution factor in a single flask. You simply look at the relative difference in volume between the incoming aliquot and the total flask volume, and that tells you how much the concentration will have dropped by. But in our example, we're doing dilution in three flasks, one after the other. So then you might well ask, what's the benefit of this dilution factor method compared to the other methods we've already looked at for calculating the concentration in the final flask? Well, the answer to that is that there's a great thing about dilution factors. And that is that during a serial dilution, if you're using this calculation method, you don't need to bother calculating the concentrations of the intermediate flasks.
If you know the dilution factor that's going to be applied in each flask, you can just multiply them all together and calculate the total dilution between the original solution and the final flask. And probably the easiest way to show this is just to do it in Excel. So here we are back in Excel, and as before I've tidied up the previous entry just to keep everything neat. So let's start off down our dilution factor route, and again the first step here is to calculate the concentration of the stock solution, which I'll do in exactly the same way as I've done for the previous two routes. And having got that in place, the next step is to work out the dilution factor associated with flask A. So here we have an aliquot volume of 1 milliliter and a final flask volume of 10 milliliters, which means that the concentration is going to end up being 10 times less. Now as I've shown in previous dilution factor videos, it doesn't actually matter which way up you calculate this fraction, so long as you remember what it is you're trying to do with the dilution factor at the end but you do need to remain consistent throughout your calculations. So for these calculations, I'm always going to be dividing the flask volume by the aliquot volume to calculate the dilution factor for each flask. So we predicted we'd have a dilution factor of 10, and that is indeed what we've calculated. It's always useful to have a good idea of what you expect the answer to be before you do the calculation and that way you can pick up on errors quite quickly. Now normally you'll have noted that I've been writing units next to every number that I've calculated in the sheet. But if you think about how we've calculated the dilution factor, we've divided a volume in milliliters by another volume in milliliters. And that means the units cancel and a dilution factor calculated this way actually has no units. So we don't really have anything to put in the unit cell. But we've calculated the dilution factor for flask A, and now we need to repeat the process for the other two flasks in exactly the same way. Having got those two equations in place, we can set about calculating the total dilution across all the flasks. And we do that simply by multiplying all the dilution factors together. So this total dilution factor indicates that the solution in flask C is 200 times less concentrated than the stock solution. And then how do we use that total dilution factor to calculate the final concentration in flask C? Well then we need to divide the concentration in the stock flask by 200 to give us the final concentration. Note that it's also perfectly possible and valid to calculate the dilution factors the other way up, as I'm doing here. So that's aliquot volume divided by flask volume. But the answer for each dilution factor is now less than 1, and when I multiply them all together at the end I get a very small number. So the trick is to look at the number you produce for the dilution factor and decide whether you need to be multiplying or dividing it in order to get the concentration you're looking for. In this case, now I have a very small dilution factor, I know I need to multiply the original concentration by that to get the final concentration. And as you can see, I still end up with the same answer. So far in this video, 
we've looked at three different methods for calculating the concentration in flask C. We've looked at the method that involves calculating the mass of salt in each aliquot, the C1V1, C2V2 method, and we've just looked at the dilution factor method. And so finally, let's look at the last method I'm going to demonstrate in this video. So for this last method, let's consider this situation. Here I have a flask containing a solution with our salt dissolved in it. If I use a pipette to take an aliquot out of this flask, then because in any solution the solute should be evenly distributed, if the pipette contains 1% of the solution from the flask, then it also contains 1% of the salt. So if I then empty this pipette into another flask, then the concentration of solution in that flask would have to be calculated using this reduced mass of salt. Then having made up the solution in that second flask, if I took 1% of that solution as an aliquot to put into a third flask, the total salt quantity in that third flask would be 1% of 1% of the original quantity of salt. So just like working out the dilution factor approach, a key benefit of using this quantity fraction approach to working out serial dilutions is that if I can work out what fraction of salt has moved from flask to flask down a serial dilution route, in order to work out the total fraction moved into the last flask, all I have to do is multiply the fractions from all the intermediate flasks together. As with the dilution factor approach, probably the easiest way to demonstrate this is to show me calculating it in Excel. So here we are back in Excel, and as you can see, I've tidied up the dilution factor method that we entered a moment ago. And that means we can crack straight on with calculating the concentration in flask C using this quantity fraction or QF method. In the QF method, we calculate the fraction of the solution that is transferred over in the aliquot, so we'll enter the QF values on all the aliquot lines. And the proportion of any solution which is extracted in the aliquot, in this case the aliquot we're taking from the stock solution to put into flask A, can be calculated as the volume of the aliquot divided by the volume of the flask from which it was taken. And then we can repeat the same calculation to work out what fraction of solution A was carried over into flask B. And then one last time to work out the proportion of flask B that is transferred into flask C. Then, to work out the total quantity fraction from the original mass of salt that ended up in flask C, we just have to multiply together all of the QFs from the intervening flasks. Then, to calculate the quantity of salt that's actually in the final flask, we multiply the initial mass by this total fraction. Finally, because we know the mass that's in that final flask now, we can also calculate its concentration. And of course we do that simply by dividing the mass by the volume the same as normal. I suppose the first thing we should confirm is that this QF method is producing the same concentration as all the other approaches. And the other thing we need to look at is the way I structured the fractions used to calculate the quantity fraction at each stage. Just like for dilution factors, it doesn't actually matter which way up you construct the fraction, so long as you keep it consistent for an entire set of calculations. So for this first set of quantity fraction calculations, I set up each fraction so that it calculated the volume of the aliquot divided by the volume of the flask from which the aliquot came. 
but it also works if you calculate the fraction the other way up. So I'll just demonstrate that now. And then you calculate the total QF the same way by multiplying all of the intermediate ones together. Intuitively, I know that the mass of salt in the final flask must be less than the mass of salt in the original flask. So looking at this QF value, I know I have to divide by it instead of multiplying by it in order to get a smaller number. So in order to calculate the actual quantity of salt in the final flask, I'll take the initial mass and divide it by this quantity factor. And now I've calculated the mass in the final flask, I can calculate its concentration as normal as mass divided by volume. And of course, it gives the same result as if I'd calculated the quantity fractions all the other way up. So just like with dilution factors, don't get hung up on which way up you do the fraction, just make sure you're consistent, and then when you see the final answer, work out then whether you're going to multiply or divide by it to get the answer you want. Finally, and although it will amuse my mother greatly to hear this, Neatness is very important in my calculations. So let me just quickly tidy up the spreadsheet before we look back at what we've covered here. We started off with a simple serial dilution problem where we were making up an initial stock solution and then diluting that three times to a final concentration. And the challenge was to calculate what that final concentration would be. In this video, I've demonstrated four different ways of calculating that same answer. The first method, shown here in blue, was the route that used the basic concentration equation itself to calculate the quantity in terms of the mass dissolved in each one of the flasks, and then used that to calculate the concentration in each flask down the line. The second method, shown in the yellow section, was basically a shortcut of the first version which combined the two calculations together using the well-known C1V1 equals C2V2 approach. The third method, shown in green, was the dilution factor method. And the final approach was the one using the quantity fraction method, shown here in pink. Hopefully, you can see that all the methods produce the same answer. So they're all equally valid methods of calculating the final solution concentration in any serial dilution. The last two methods you'll notice don't actually require us to calculate the concentration of all the flasks in the dilution series. For these methods we simply calculate how that concentration is going to change from flask to flask or what proportion of the total mass is being transferred from flask to flask and then we can use that information to calculate the concentration in the final flask directly. I find the quantity fraction method to be the most intuitive approach and it's the one I most often apply myself. Part of the reason why I find this the most intuitive way is that we often don't care what the concentration of the solutions are except for the final solution we analyse. So it's an added complication to be dealing with the concentrations of all the earlier flasks. All I really care about is the mass of the analyte that I'm putting into the final flask. So from my perspective, serial dilutions aren't an exercise in making intermediate solutions of known concentrations at all. They're simply a tool that I'm using to help me subdivide a mass of analyte that I can weigh out down to a tiny fraction of that which I can't weigh out but which is the mass I actually need to make up the solution that I'm going to analyse. Obviously, there's a lot of detail in this presentation and it's very unlikely that you will have had the time to appreciate all of this in a single sitting as it flashed past at speed. So like with many tutorial videos, I recommend going through this presentation again making up your own spreadsheet as you go along step by step. This is to make sure you understand all the steps I've gone through 
and to help make sure you cement the knowledge so you can use it again in the future. Hopefully this will also have the added benefit of letting you think about dilutions from more than one direction of thought, and this should give you a better and more confident understanding about what you're doing in the lab. So thanks for watching this video, and if you like it, or if it's been useful, please subscribe to my channel where you'll get notifications about other tutorial videos when I post them. And if you want me to make a video on a particular mass spec or chemistry topic important to you, then please get in touch.